Good morning, everybody. Why don't we go ahead and, uh, and get started. Uh, first off, let me say uh, I'm Tim Hayes from the Office of E-Diplomacy, and uh, welcome to day two of uh, Tech at State, wiki.gov. Uh, for those of you who weren't here uh, here yesterday, we had some uh, some great sessions, and I'm really looking forward to some uh, sessions today, sort of of equal quality and caliber. And we're, we're going to focus today on uh, federal government wikis. So, um, before we get started, I'd like to just say a couple of things. First, uh, thanks to all of you for coming, and we need to say thanks to our partners because we really can't put on these events without some support from some great organizations. Uh, and so let's do a real shout out to the GW Law School, to MetroStar Systems, who does the tweet moderation that you see on the screen, and also to uh, Wikimania 2012 and the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, they've been great partners, and uh, as you can see throughout the Marvin Center, it's just uh, it's a, it's a wonderful event. Uh, I should also say welcome to all of our uh, live stream audience as well. I know we have some people in, in Canada that are probably watching in with great interest and uh, hopefully some uh, people from other places around the world at some of our embassies. Um, and with that, why don't we go ahead and get started. I'll turn the floor over to our moderator, Gray Brooks. Gray has recently uh, gone on detail from the Federal Communications uh, Agency over to uh, GSA, where he's working on the digital government strategy. So he's obviously a great person to be moderating our first panel. So Gray, over to you. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. And please, uh, right now we have several good presentations coming up. Um, they're, uh, they're actually, we've got to look at the slides. They're very, uh, very thorough and actually quite interesting. I think you're going to like them. Um, but also, one of the things you're going to be hearing throughout is that we really do want this to be a very involved discussion uh, after the presentations wrap up. Uh, the, the handle that we're using specific to this event is tech at state, uh, AT spelled out for at. Um, and go ahead and throughout the event, uh, if you'll start sending in questions with that hashtag, uh, there's a couple of good folks in the back who are going to be keeping an eye on those and uh, your questions will get returned to uh, during the Q&A session. Um, as as uh, Tim was kind of to say, I'm, I'm Gray Brooks and, and my goal here is to do as little as talking as possible and try to uh, enable all of you to have as good of a conversation with these three folks. So without further ado, uh, the folks you're going to be hearing from today include uh, Peter from, I believe, BLS. And his focus, uh, for any of you who are actually in U.S. government, I think is very relevant at the time being because, um, uh, uh, to put it in a hackneyed way, he's, he's thinking about wikis and government in a very meta fashion. Um, Liz, actually, we got a preview of her presentation, and there are several dynamics to it that uh, I think actually intrigued all the rest of, the, of us on this panel uh, and look forward to hearing about what she's doing over at the Marine Corps. Uh, and then lastly, Ryan is with us uh, down from Ottawa uh, to basically show uh, just as extensively as, as we're looking at how some of these things are happening in the U.S. federal government, uh, they're already well on track in the Canadian government. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Peter, I believe you're first. Thanks, Greg. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I used to be a software engineer. Then I went to school in economics. Now I'm a researcher at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But I do not speak for the Bureau of Labor Statistics or any government institution, and none of these are official statistics. I've been advocating the use of wikis in government for a long time. Today's subject is, um, as far as I can tell, there are three very big ones in the U.S. government, and if I get this or any other fact wrong, please feel free to correct me afterward. We'll take a quick look at those, and then uh, Understand that there are many other wikis in government across agencies and, and within agencies. Look a little bit at the design differences and then think about the purposes people are trying to achieve. Intellipedia is an interesting well-known one brought about partly from a sense of crisis. They needed to respond differently to a world of networked opportunities and dangers. They set up, after a thinking process and publishing process, uh, wikis, blogs, messaging systems across 16 intelligence agencies. The wiki is media wiki. The pages are editable right from the browser. It's the same software as Wikipedia. 
and there's a lot of issues about which things are secret and which are not secret, but I'm not expert on that. Diplopedia, many of you know uh, much more than I do, um, brought about at the same time but with a different idea that people arriving at a new place should have access to the procedures and information relevant to that place and it could be stored online, shared and um, copied from place to place. From past uh, research by the Diplopedia founders, they uh, showed that the number of articles grows linearly with time. And that seems to be true in many of these systems, at least the successful ones. A lot of wikis go dead. The ones that are lively grow linearly, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that not very many people are adding articles, but they are fanatics, and they keep going and add some over time at some steady rate. Here is a, the oldest um, city wiki that I'm aware of because the Omaha city wiki keeps track of other city wikis. They have a kind of census and we could use that in our federal government. But this is the oldest one I could find or the oldest media wiki, the city of Karlsruhe, Germany. And it grows a little different from linearly. There's a, there's a boom of interest early and then it slows down later. In terms of number of articles, it could be that the number of words being added is growing linearly. But the Wikipedia also has this curved shape of a boom of interest early and then they're filling out their space or there is a loss of interest in a later period. With very large possible audience, that seems more likely, that curve. Uh, a third very large wiki, and by very large I mean tens of thousands of people who have viewed, edited um, uh, the content tens of thousands of pages. Uh, this one looks a little different. This is the Confluence software. It has discussion boards and other more social attributes than the, the MediaWiki does. On this example page, they list um, in the lower right recent edits and who made them to communicate a sense that there is a dynamism, that things are happening. It's broken into communities focused originally on budget, which is a, a formal specific need of the OMB to, to have budget flow information. So it's a, partly a document repository for information related to budgets. It has fine-grained security, so it's possible to have a zone where just a few specific people can read, a few specific people can write. They have an easier login procedure from other agencies than many of our wikis can. They have a, a staff that does development and makes, and, and that is an important capability for the future, that if government computers can recognize other government computers, they will log in quickly or they will need to log in less often. Our ID cards in government may at some point give our computers the information they need to identify us. Then services like this hosted at other agencies will be quickly available across the government, and that will be an important benefit. There are many, many other wikis. I'm collecting information on them. I'm interested in hearing from other people about them. I would like to talk about many more, and we want to learn from international examples a lot. Um, more on that later. A couple important differences in design are worth remembering because they come up again and again as I look at these systems or more often interview people who use them. Some have a very broad concept. For example, we'll be hearing about the Canadian GCpedia, which is available across their civil service, and that makes a lot more interchange and benefit possible. The systems I have shown you are large, but they're focused on some uh, focused pool of knowledge. And that is, I think, a kind of idiosyncratic contingent outcome. That isn't exactly a, the, an architecture that we necessarily did on purpose. I had always thought that a broad cross-government one would be better and that we would get there by one of these expanding to be available to everyone. It isn't happening yet. Uh, in fact, we have a situation where many U.S. federal staff don't have access to a wiki or don't have access to one that reaches across agencies. And one uh, key, key user attribute of that is that it means that we cannot email to someone else in government a hyperlink that will just plain work for the other person. 
And the broader a wiki we had, the easier it would be to have document up on a platform like that, documents or wiki pages, and just email a link and know that it will work for the other person. The path that the U.S. structure is on leads to more and more wikis, which means more and more administrators, more and more namespaces, more and more administrators, and more and more battles over what software should be run and how. Another difference, uh, partly in use, but partly in the feature set, is whether people upload documents. A memo written by some named person, addressed to some named person, and a named date that is finished and complete with an introduction, conclusion, this is a document. And these are put in repositories. People don't want them edited like wiki pages. But wiki people, like myself, are, are looking or, or needing to use a system that is fragmentary, edited by many people, where a, where a particular page is updated frequently or ad hoc or by someone we don't know. Those are different capabilities, sometimes offered on the same system. I observe over and over that people are either using not quite the right feature in the one they've got, or the feature they need is just not available there. But these are different functions. Another difference conceptually in what people are, are designing or trying to do on a wiki is whether it's supposed to be a reference work, like Wikipedia, global, broadly written, descriptive, kind of a scientific concept of what it is, versus a, a project uh, orientation, which in one which there might be rapid status updates, where the the language or terminology used is is internal to a small group, and may require security features to keep other people from seeing it. In case it's not clear what I mean by a reference work in government, since we often think in project terms, I, I'm one of the founders of Statopedia, which is a, a wiki. Uh, a running media wiki, not a big one, but for the statistical functions, statistical agencies, and we, we have this kind of reference concept. What are past censuses? What are other uh, industry classifications out there in the world? We should have information on all of them, in principle. That's the kind of thing you would expect a statistical agency to have, a knowledge base of lots of previous censuses by us or by anybody so that we know everything there is to know about that, the history of our own activities, hot new technical subjects. One we'll be hearing about today is Semantic Media Wiki. This is relevant to what statistical agencies do. We aren't doing anything with it, but we should be accumulating a pool of open public information amongst ourselves about that. We compare agency practices and policies by inviting people to reply on issues of policy or practice. I was working on a social media team at BLS, started a page on editing Wikipedia for work, because an agency doesn't allow all of its people to do that necessarily, and there may be rules about it. And it turned out, I discovered after posting uh, uh, a, a page inviting comment on this issue, that EPA has a good set of rules, NIH has a good set of rules, many of these are public, some are internal. And these are good examples for us. And for an agency that doesn't wish to lead on a particular subject, it helps a lot to have a library of what the other agencies are doing. Other topics or classifications, uh, I have a page on every one of those wikis I listed. Part of what we need to do is copy the techniques of others. We can do that by keeping a library of them, looking at them when we can, keeping a picture, keeping a contact person for the other wiki, not because we are doing wikis for the public, but that's part of our internal practice. List of events coming up, notes of past events, critiques of what our agency does uh, and our natural replies to them, which are evolving over time, and then most valuably source code. If we can share source code, it doesn't have to be developed a second time. A wiki is not an ideal source code control system. We would like to have a source code control system across government broadly. But a wiki will do in the short run. Uh, I've heard a lot about the, the, the arguments for, and the, the wikis you've seen have a tight link to the official job of the agency, the, the, the direction it gets from Congress. There are a lot of other visions of what should be happening. Um, the language of openness or transparency suggests we have no privacy, 
as white collar workers. More realistically, we should have some privacy. We need it and we also want it. So I prefer the word translucency. The citizen cannot see everything we do as we work with uh, statistical information, but maybe neighboring agencies can see a lot through internal federal systems. There are rhetorics that recurrently come back against the use of wikis, and these are, these are partly real and, and uh, partly disputable, but that these systems are in, insecure, that they haven't previously been authorized, and that they encourage people to be sloppy with information or undignified with information, that, that as a person who wishes to protect my reputation, I should have to check some computer system to see if the people are saying bad things about my project. That's a, that's a new problem for people. Um, and although there are, it sounds great to say we should have a knowledge base, that's not our job. Maybe we don't have time for that. People who push for wikis have a whole lot of things in mind that are worth mentioning because they don't seem to survive when advocated for as a purpose for a wiki. Um, broadly speaking, like other technologies, uh, we have to use the ones that citizens are going to use. And if citizens are interacting with wikis, getting their information from wikis, we are in the business of delivering information and should be using good technologies for ourselves and technologies that will interoperate effectively with them. Uh, for example, and there's a science and practice of this, there's, a, there's a research conferences and a research literature. So this is a natural subject of research for us to improve our programs. And for example, writing for Wikipedia may be a way of directly meeting our mission to communicate uh, the kind of information that they might otherwise call us to ask, make it easy, reduce our calls, make it easy for them. Which doesn't mean that wiki writing for Wikipedia is always a good idea or that we don't need a policy, but it might be a, a good approach. Wikis also empower many of the people who have them. It's a kind of benefit if you have rapid, easy access to expertise. For example, if you wish to make an academic publication, it's useful to interact with people who have done it or who are uh, leading experts in a relevant field. It's beneficial to experts in obscure subjects, and my agency has many of them, if they can serve a larger audience. That sustains their capacity to get, get deeper and deeper into their specialty. It also, in principle, empowers the agency managers. Uh, they tend not to see it this way, but Agency managers often feel constrained, under-resourced, um, overburdened, boxed in. But actually, working together, the agencies have so much expertise, computer resources, knowledge, and flexibility that systems that help them work together in a voluntary way can help them uh, maintain control in an environment of, uh, where they don't have control over everything. There's, a, there's an agenda of uh, improving the use of knowledge in decision making, um, sometimes called data decision driven making. But there are a lot of aspects to that. One is that we want pe pe people to be able to refer to convincing sources, drill down into evidence, and a wiki helps them do that. A wiki could be thick with footnotes, hyperlinks to other things, uh, References to documents that you can't see, but you can see who it is referring to that document. You have an expert to reach out to. And uh, an efficient scientific community is building its own scientific tools. We can do that if we have interoperable systems with software that's open that we can add to. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the ways in which this is subversively helpful to good government is that if we had a pool of convincing information, for example, on how agencies are using open source software, specifically by name, and whether it was working for them, that would undermine some of the things that uh, are, are given as arguments not to use the, the cheapest or freest or most open software. And that might straightforwardly save hundreds of millions of dollars in our government. Also, if information is on platforms, broadly searchable, and this is part of the Intellipedia concept, then it reduces uh, the strain of direct one-to-one -one communication. And my email is overwhelming, and if I receive a megabyte long document at a time the other person's ready to send it, but I'm not ready to read it, 
that's not ideal for me. It's better for me to, that it's on a platform, and when I search for it, I can find it. That's a discoverability idea, as opposed to the dissemination idea that it shows up in my box. Most interestingly, a wiki is not just itself an innovation, it supports other innovation by making pools of knowledge that people will copy from. If we directly compare practices between agencies, it becomes much easier to consider a possible alternative practice. We can imagine that future workers will have a right to have access to a wiki so that they have a way of communicating practices that exist, which they may think are not good or which they think should be copied. We have an inspector general's office that looks for waste, but this is a way of uh, reducing stupidity. Most interesting is emergent or open source innovation. Am I out of time? Okay. I'm less often giving talks on wikis than on technological innovation and in startup industries. Very briefly, in the late 19th century, there's a huge literature and a set of practice uh, experiments of how things can fly in the air. Octave Chanute is an important person who made that glider in the middle. The Wrights then, the Wright brothers, the famous Wright brothers who will later invent the airplane, copy it. And that's not a hypothesis. It says in the letter, the apparatus I intend to employ is similar to your machine of 1896. The Wrights then make kites and gliders based on that model. They make important engineering improvements. They get to the airplane. Then shortly after that, a startup industry happens. In this prehistory, you can see that pools of knowledge and experiment lead to a new industry. And if we think government workers can do that, it will help them to have pools of knowledge to copy from. Thank you. My name is Liz Mooney. I work for a company called Millcord, and we have built the Marine Corps Civil Information Management System Semantic Wiki, which I'll be referring to as MarSIMS. Uh, MarSIMS is a knowledge portal built for the United States Marine Corps that addresses challenges faced, with civil, faced within civil military operations today. So the community of practice that we're cultivating within our wiki consists of SIM practitioners. So, before I delve into this realm and, and start throwing out these keywords, I just want to give you some definitions. Uh, civil military operations, CMO, are activities that establish, maintain, or influence relations between military forces and civilians in an area of operations. CMO teams conduct civil information management, or SIM, which is a process by which information is gathered about civil areas, structures, capabilities, organizations, people, and events. So on the agenda for today um, are the following. What needs of the mil civil military operations community are we addressing? What is a semantic wiki? What is the MARSIMS semantic wiki? What are the benefits of our, uh, of our approach? And what future research are we involved in? So what is the distinct need that we are addressing through MARSIMS? I think the answer to this question was best articulated to me by a major general that I met in Thailand. Um, earlier this year, I went to Thailand to support the troops as they were using MARSIMS. Um, and this major general said to me, he said, um, we need a centralized information management system so that we don't have teams going out to the same areas every year, conducting interviews with the same civilians, um, and conducting humanitarian assistance projects in areas where there's no demonstrated need. So I think what the Major General really hit the nail on the head with here is that data sharing remains a huge, a huge challenge when we look at current solutions supporting civil information management today. Um, <laughs> knowledge doesn't persist over time and analysis is limited due to incomplete data. One of the particular disadvantages of current approaches is that um, 
they are document centric, which makes it really difficult to find facts. And in addition, information isn't structured or annotated, uh, which makes it difficult to delve within dimensions of data to find relationships and construct a big picture of the operating environment. So. In response to these challenges of document-centric approaches, we've built MarSims upon a semantic media wiki platform. What is a semantic wiki? Um, as some of you may know, a semantic wiki differs from a regular wiki like Wikipedia in that it is built upon a knowledge model that captures and identifies relationships between and among pages. The key difference is that through semantic annotations or through tagging the data, Semantic Wiki allows information within a machine to be machine understandable, or within a wiki to be machine understandable. So this allows users to go to the wiki to um, ask questions and receive answers instead of a list of related documents or a list of related pages as with most search engines. So now we'll delve into some of the specifics of MarSims Semantic Wiki. Um, MarSims is, by definition, a knowledge portal for civil information management that enables users to collect, organize, tag, share, browse, visualize, and share structured sim knowledge. So what it looks like in practice is this. Users in the field are equipped with a mobile device. So upon that mobile device is an application that contains more than 40 different forms. These forms allow users to document um, civil information. So um, users will conduct assessments about schools, buildings, roads. Um, they may conduct assessments with civilians, documenting you know, interactions they've had with civilians or engagements they've had with key leaders. They may conduct medical surveys regarding the medical needs of a population. Um, so once this information is entered into the mobile app, it's automatically ingested into the wiki and automatically annotated. Um, so this allows the data to be interlinked with sociocultural and community knowledge, allowing users to gain a greater understanding of their area of operations. Furthermore, um, as, I, as I was saying with the search engine, users can go to the wiki to ask questions and receive answers about the operating environment. What's really neat with Semantic Wiki is that these answers can take the form of a variety of export formats. So they can take the form of tables, charts, graphs, timelines, calendars, um, even maps. So here you can see an overview of the MarSims process. Um, you can see from this visualization that MarSims is a central knowledge repository that captures data collected upon the mobile devices. This empowers the CMO management process on the one hand by monitoring data collection status and quality in real time and facilitates CMO planning on the other hand because it provides insight for planning based on analysis of field collected data. Delving into some of the more technical details, um, Information is collected in the field upon the mobile app that you see in the lo lower left-hand corner. Once these mobile apps are synced, they automatically are ingested into the wiki where each form is mapped onto a semantic form. Um, so each form becomes a page in the wiki, each assessment becomes a page, which is automatically semantically annotated in subject-object property formalism. Um, using this structured data, we can really delve into the into the relationships between data and uh, and derive insights from that. You can see some of the statistics of our MarSims wiki. Uh, we've ingested uh, more than 11,000 assessments and more than 2,000 photographs using more than 40 different forms. We have a dynamic ontology with 114 categories, more than 40,000 pages, and at this point we have uh, almost 81,000 views. Um, so in this past year, we've uh, participated in Cobra Gold exercises in Thailand, Bali Catan exercises in the Philippines, uh, Pacific Partnership in around Southeast Asia, Civil Military Support Element in Cambodia, and we look forward to supporting Black Sea Rotational Force operations in Eastern Europe later this year. So now I, I kind of want to give you an example, some examples of how the wiki is actually used by operators in the field and how it delivers value uh, to the operators. To start off with, I'd like to go over some of the collaboration features that we've enabled. Um, on every page, on every assessment page, there's a discussion tab that allows users to start discussions with other users and uh, you know, ask questions about data. 
this might seem really, really basic to a room full of people who are acquainted with Wikipedia and use wikis on a regular basis, but this is a huge step forward for CMO um, operators because truly before this point, there's been no way to document discrepancies within data or you know, talk, about, uh, talk about data as it's being collected. So this really, um, this really uh, enhances data quality in that operators are able to go to the talk pages, uh, openly document discrepancies, talk about those discrepancies, and learn from them. So we've tried to facilitate some kind of familiarity upon these talk pages by leveraging Twitter-like mention features. So using the at sign, the users can, uh, can use Twitter mention features to email users directly from the wiki. So moving on, I'm going to show you some of the analysis and data aggregation that Marsims can, can do. Uh, first of all, Marsims helps users to monitor team activity. So by leveraging the semantic annotations that exist on every page, we can run semantic queries like this that create dynamic tables. So this specifically is a dynamic table of all the situation reports submitted by a civil affairs group during exercises in, in Thailand. Um, What's notable about this table is no one drew this table. This is completely dynamic. It's the result of a semantic query so that every time you go to this page, it's pulling from the freshest information within the database. Um, this provides a lot of value for troops because instead of having to go through hard drives of situation reports or searching through long documents for hard to find facts, they have all the information they need about a team's activity within a single page. Moving on, similarly, we can create dynamic charts like this one that monitors the progression rate of an, en an engineering site. Uh, the Marines go into uh, foreign countries to complete engineering projects to provide you know, infrastructure support uh, to the host country. Uh, this, this chart in particular is, is, uh, is graphing the completion rate being the completion rate at one of the schools that the Marines were building in Thailand. Again, this is valuable because it's 100% real time. Uh, no one drew this table, or no one drew this chart, and it's pulling from the freshest information available. This table details the demographic breakdown of patients as information is collected about them at a medical site where the Marines are surveying the medical needs of a population and providing assistance. Uh, these tables are deceptive because you look at them and you think, oh, I could make that in Excel. No, you couldn't. Um, these are the results of 66 semantic queries that are running all at once doing constant recalculations of the data. Uh, again, it's valuable because it's real time. Uh, Marines in the Philippines this past year derived a lot of value from these tables because they were able to go to this page and get quick head counts of how many um, of how many patients had passed through registration during the day, um, what they were coming for, were, were individuals coming for pediatric appointments, were they coming for optometry appointments, and plan medical relief throughout the day accordingly. So over the past few slides, I've shown you some of the more basic semantic analysis that we can complete, but really harnessing the power of semantic annotations allows us to delve into multiple dimensions of the data to derive insight. So, in this example, um, we're demonstrating the, we're showing the distribution of responses to a question asking, what is the best way to inform patients from site one with low or no access to healthcare of future events? So what's going on here is we're delving into the data four times. We're saying, so first of all, we're looking within category medical registration surveys. Within that category, uh, we're looking for respondents from flood relief site one. Third for respondents from site one, uh, we're looking for respondents who had low or no access to health care, and for individuals that fit all of those categories, what is the best way that they could be informed of future events? So this type of multidimensional analysis can really help us derive insights about subsets of the population, um, and this particular example can help inform troops how best to communicate with, with those subsets. Um, so. In addition, multidimensional analysis can help us derive insight about how to prioritize assistance and staffing requirements within operations. So as you read through this slide detailing the benefits of our approach, I'm going to tell you a short anecdote. Um, when I was in Thailand this past year, it was the first time that any of the troops had been 
had even seen the wiki. Um, so to be fair, they were a little skeptical at first. So they decided to send one, or one form of their assessments through email to their commander, and then another form through the system. So they would use the mobile apps to enter their assessments, which, which were automatically uh, ingested into the wiki. This only happened for two days. After two days, uh, the commander said, no more email. We're just going to use the wiki from now on. Um, so the troops preferred the wiki over email, which was absolutely their modest operandi until that point, um, because instead it saved them a tremendous amount of time. Instead of having to check through emails, make phone calls regarding team activity, they could just check the wiki. Um, it allowed them to view information in real time help them to contextualize their mission through uh, community and sociocultural knowledge, and enabled them to document their discussions about the data as it was being collected, thus enhancing data quality in a big, big way. So all in all, this wiki empowered the users to gain a greater sense of, greater sense of situational awareness and really facilitated their uh, decision-making processes. So finally, I just want to go over some of the future research we have planned. Uh, we're developing a semantic answer engine with a user-friendly UI so that uh, users can go into the wiki and slice and dice the data themselves, conduct semantic analysis themselves. We're de in the works is a community answer engine so that users can go to the wiki to ask questions to other users in a discussion board type setting. Automation of data ingest with automated annotation. We're always looking for new ways to bring in data and automatically annotate it, especially free text areas. Uh, mobile awareness, uh, allowing troops to receive mobile notifications regarding team progress, cultural and situational data points. We want to allow data to be pushed back onto the mobile devices um, within a map environment. And finally, what we're really um, invested in developing right now is spatial semantics. So uh, developing a capability that will allow us to complete geospatial semantic searches so that on a map interface, you can draw a polygon and say, what are all the community leaders within this area and receive a response. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to the organizers of Tech at State to come down from Ottawa and have a chance to talk to you about the work that we've been doing in the federal government around using wikis and collaborative technologies. Uh, a big hello to my colleagues who are in Ottawa watching this right now. I certainly hope you all participate in the Q&A part afterwards. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about GCpedia, the Government of Canada's internal wiki, tell you a bit about the history of the project. Uh, a little bit about the current status of it, and talk a bit about the future of it, where we're going, and some of the lessons learned through that process. Uh, a little bit about us first. I work for the Chief Information Officer branch uh, in the Treasury Board Secretariat. Treasury Board Secretariat is essentially the management, uh, central management arm of the Canadian government, uh, and we work for the Chief Information Officer for the Canadian government. Uh, the GC 2.0 Program Office, which I represent here today, uh, is a unit within the, the CIO's branch that is specifically looking at both policy and strategy development around the effective use of Web 2.0 in the federal government, and also also looking at the provision of collaborative tools for public servants. So this is the ecosystem of Web 2.0 in the Government of Canada right now, and it really has three different layers to it. So on that bottom blue layer, you see external tools, the ones that all of us are familiar with that we use in our personal lives, but certainly also use in our professional lives as well. But then we have a number of departmental tools, and really around 2006, 2007, uh, a number of different departments started experimenting with internal wikis, internal professional networks, internal blogs, ways for employees within those departments to be able to engage with each other. But much like as Peter was talking about, many of those exist within that departmental silo, and while they certainly break down barriers within departments, they don't allow people within departments to talk to their fellow public servants in other agencies. And so and then finally we have that middle layer, those GC-wide tools. And those are the three tools that the GC 2.0 Program Office uh, and Treasury Board administers. So it's GCpedia, which is a media wiki platform, the Government of Canada's internal wiki. 
GC Forms, which is a threaded discussion form application based on a .NET technology. And then finally, GC Connects, which has been our professional networking pilot uh, based on the ELG platform. Now, the benefits and why we use these tools, I think, for this audience are certainly self-evident, but they're very powerful ways for us to be able to connect with people. And I think really importantly, all three of these tools exist on a government-wide platform, which allow every public servant, regardless of where they are, both in terms of departments and also in terms of geography, to be able to connect with every other public servant. So it really, I think, is an interesting innovation. And if I were going to say there's one killer app behind these GC 2.0 tools, as we call them, I think it is that ability for everybody and every public servant to be able to tap into them and to be able to use them. But today's conference, or this weekend's conference, is all about wikis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of GCpedia and where it came from. So the idea behind GCpedia is a simple one, which was let's go and create a government-wide wiki that allows everybody to collaborate and share information. Um, around 2007, Natural Resources Canada and a number of other departments started using wikis on a departmental level, but there was a decision made to say, why can't we try installing this on a government-wide basis and see if we can pull everybody together as part of that? So part of being able to do that effectively was you needed to have the right people in the right place at the right time who were able to absorb the risk around the project and say we're going to take something that's a little bit different, a little bit outside the box and protect it long enough so that it can actually happen and come to fruition. So the launch of it was very much a viral type of launch. There wasn't a formal announcement, there wasn't a formal procurement process or a formal rollout process. There really was the notion of, let's get a group of people together, let's put it up on a server, let's flick the switch and have it available for everybody. Really as a true proof of concept to see if this would even work, if there would be any take up for it, if people would want to use it. The closest it came to a formal announcement was the Chief Information Officer at the time, Ken Cochran, at our annual Government Technology Conference in 2008, went up on stage and announced that this proof of concept was now available for public servants to be able to access. So October 28, 2008, we generally consider it to be GCpedia's birthday. So it's approaching four years in age. So the question was, is this going to work? And when it was launched, there certainly was people who were skeptical of it. Um, this is GCpedia as it exists, the main page. It's a media wiki install. Uh, you get a sense we have some community announcements on there. A lot of the general types of features you would see on a, on a GCpedia or on a media wiki install in any other type of agency. And so what was the reaction to this? Well, I think this little cartoon kind of illustrates that well. It's from our friends at uh, GovPlus Memes, which I should note is a fantastically hilarious site that takes internet memes and mashes them up with public servant um, kind of inside jokes. But I think there was the skepticism of, are people going to actually use this? And the answer is yes. Uh, this shows you over time the metrics around GCpedia and the increase in growth. And I think somewhat similar to what Peter had shown in his presentation, the growth has been linear, but it has been steady, it has been increasing, and we're now up at over 33,000 registered users, you know, of which 2,500 are active contributors. Uh, and we're up to over three quarters of a million edits on the, on the wiki and 18,000 plus pages of content. But we're also seeing, and I think interestingly, a wide scope of usage across geography. Um, obviously, as we would expect in the capital, we have a lot of people in Ottawa and Hull, which is our Gatineau, which is the Quebec side of the river. But we certainly have people from coast to coast who are tapping in and using GCpedia. It's a fantastic way to do this. And actually, some of our embassies have access to GCpedia as well. So we've certainly had hits from around the world also. Uh, and I think the other point I want to point out is that the use is consistent. This is showing daily unique visitors to the site. And you can see we're getting up to about 3,000 or so daily unique visitors onto GCpedia. But I think it's amazing that that's consistent. This isn't one-times or one-offs. There really is a steady heartbeat that goes on with GCpedia over time. Now, we also did a little bit of an analysis a few years ago around how it's being used in terms of the user base. And normally there's the 90-90 or 99-1 rule around the power laws of using collaborative technologies. Our friends at Policy Horizons, an internal uh, 
think tank within the government of Canada, helped us crunch some numbers, and we came up with this power law for GCpedia. And I'll blow up that bottom corner, because that's really where all the action is, because it's a very long tail. And we found that the power law for GCpedia is really a 78, 21.5, power law. So what that means, I think, a little bit clearer is if we go to this graph, 0.5% of the users are responsible for 50% of the content. And that top approximately 3.6% of users are responsible for 90% of all the content on GCpedia if we're using edits as the metric to be able to measure content. So I think it's an interesting thing as we think about that small number of power users who are really contributing to what GCpedia becomes. Now, how is it being used? When GCpedia was created, it really was put up there with a the notion that it is a sandbox. We wanted people to play with it and find out what the most effective use of it was going to be. We didn't want it to be a replication of Wikipedia or an encyclopedia in that way, but we wanted it to be a knowledge base. And we found that it's been used in a number of very interesting, distinct types of ways. So number one, it's a barrier to be, it breaks down barriers in terms of interdepartmental information sharing. This is an example of a federal inventory of the North, where in the past we had dozens of agencies that had to submit reports centrally. Instead, the department said, all of you post on the wiki and we can share it that way and reduce the amount of internal paperwork that has to happen. This is another great example of information sharing. These are from our colleagues at the Department of Foreign Affairs, where they've moved their open policy development work onto the wiki so they can share across government some of the great research that's being produced both internally and externally. I note as well on this page, they have some other interesting functionality embedded. They've got a Twitter feed embedded into the wiki so you can follow external Twitter conversations. They've even put some polling features in place so they can actually poll users on the wiki. And I'll note that this project has gotten a lot of uh, popularity and uh, visibility in government with the clerk of the Privy Council, the head of our public service, highlighting this as one of the interesting examples of innovative, innovative changes in the workplace in the government of Canada. Um, we've also used it to enable decision making. So this is an example of a project I worked on last year with my team on developing guidelines for the external use of Web 2.0. And what we did here was instead of the just traditional policy development process, which we did, we also posted drafts of the policy on the wiki so that government users across government who were interested in contributing to it could. And so they could see drafts as it develops. They were able to comment on the comment page. And it really was a way for us to reach out to people who wouldn't traditionally be part of a policy consultation process. And then finally, it can be used for professional networking. This is an example where we have our national inventory of bridgeable students. These are students who may be doing co-op placements that are eligible for being bridged into the full public service. Provides an inventory for them to be able to add their names on here while they're in their positions so that employers can pull them from that database. So this, I think, represents where we are now. This is an interesting graphic I had found, which is a combination between the Gartner hype cycle and Jeffrey Moore's work around the chasm in developing IT technologies. And I had argued this is where we are right now. We're in between both that trough of disillusionment and the chasm, as Jeffrey Moore talks about, where we've gotten the early adopters on to the, the platform, but we still need to make that leap to get the majority of people on. If we think about the Canadian government, it has approximately 250,000 to 300,000 employees across the country. So our 33,000 registered users really represent about that first 15%. I think the goal now is how do we get from 15% to 90%? How do we get that majority of users on there? So as we've been thinking through this process in recent uh, months, I want to leave you with kind of five key lessons that have occurred to us as we've thought about our history of GCPD over the last four years. So the first of them is culture change does take time. Another graphic from GovPlus memes, but I think illustrates this notion that is still out there for some people where there's almost that fear factor around the wiki. There's a bit of a concern around how to use it for a whole number of reasons, which actually some of the other panelists mentioned as well. Secondly, this notion of build it and they will come. This is what people expect, I think, often to happen with new IT collaboration platforms, that we're going to open the doors and a massive rush of people will come in. I think the reality is more often or not, it looks like this. We lay out the red carpet and we stand there waiting for people to come and engage. And the lesson is that there has to be a dedicated way to engage people and pull people in to collaborate and get them to engage. 
The third lesson is, in the government context, policy compliance is a real legitimate barrier to entry. You know, this is an example of, in the Canadian government context, the types of policy considerations we have to think about when we talk about any kind of government-wide collaboration system, which includes things which wouldn't be an issue in the United States, like official languages. Number four, the notion of having the right tools to fit the job that people actually need. Uh, you know, this may be a bit of a controversial statement at a conference about wikis, but I find sometimes we can fall into the issue that that old adage of if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, and so GCpedia has been the biggest platform we have internally for collaboration, but wikis aren't designed to do everything. And so part of what we're trying to think through right now is how do we make that transition to have a more robust toolkit that gives people all the tools they need to be able to work effectively. Uh, and then finally, I think it's this notion about having a successful pilot is very different than having a successful full production system. And some of the tools and skills and strategies that make a pilot project successful don't necessarily translate to the same kind of skills and tools and competencies you need to be able to run a system government-wide that everybody can use, not just the technically advanced capable, eager users, but to really mainstream this to wide production. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the discussion later on. Thanks. Uh, so now we have a period of questions and answers, but also discussion. And I definitely want to encourage everyone to uh, take part in that. Um, I've encouraged these folks to ask each other questions as well. Uh, and then also we have questions coming in through tech at state hashtag on Twitter. Uh, one thing I'd ask because of people watching on live stream, um, please make sure that you come up to the microphone uh, and uh, try, to, try to ask your question and, and, and you know, limit the follow-ups because uh, from what I understand uh, at this conference, it's been quite, a, quite an active conversation. So please, let's. My name. Uh, hold on. My name is one second, sir. Uh, the microphone. Ah. Okay. My name is David Thompson. I'm from the Wiki uh, Mania Conference upstairs. And some people from the State Department led me into coming down here. I have three points. First a praise, then a caution, and then a question. First of all, the praise. The federal government is the easiest place for people on Wikipedia to find things they can then use in adding material to Wikipedia. I went and added biographies of various federal agency people uh, in uh, because I could get the biographies very easily and they're a public domain. So that's, that's a praise. Uh, the next thing to say for Wikipedia, if you go in and start creating adding on uh, information about your agency on Wikipedia, you better think first about conflict of interest. So go to WP colon COI, conflict of interest, and read the policy before you plunge in. Uh, my question is, uh, I come down here as a Wikipedia editor, always looking for places I can get more information, and particularly the first presentation about all those wikis all over the place. What, are the, what kinds of wikis are there available for the public to read? What kinds of wikis are there for the public to actually contribute? And I imagine the vast number of them are limited to the agencies or other government employees. So tell me about the public aspect of this, what you're doing, and uh, on those three levels. Can we look at it? Can we uh, edit it? Uh, or is it just closed? So if, if y'all are game, we can just go down the line. Um, two that come to mind offhand, uh, so General Services Administration, they've been leading a couple innovation efforts. One was um, over the last year trying to uh, help figure out some paths forward with mobile. Um, as uh, government representative on mobile devices and then also uh, the workforce using mobile devices, similar to what Liz was talking about. Uh, that was open to the full public, um, government employees, citizens alike. 
uh, for, for kind of crowdsourcing some of the documentation and thought behind that. And we're using that now, actually, as, as a core part of the material for the digital government strategy. Uh, another one uh, that's front-facing, it's uh, it, actually, I don't think it's been uh, largely talked about yet, but wiki.data.gov is actually a very good model uh, because they use the, the OMB Max authentication engine to very easily have a media wiki that's front facing to the public, but then um, in this case, uh, currently kept to uh, government employees for authentication, because there is a use case for for both environments. Uh, but but I'd look there, and do y'all know of other good examples offhand? Oh, there's Open Energy uh, from the Energy Department, I think. I don't know so many. Uh, open Energy from the Energy Department. OpenEI.org. Just on this point, I was going to mention, I think it's a good question you raised, and this is certainly in the Canadian context. We've talked about it a number of times. So GCpedia and, to my knowledge, all of the departmental wikis that exist are all internal. So the public can't view or edit them. And the discussion has been around, should there be a publicly facing wiki as well, or should these wikis become publicly facing? And I think while there's still active debate about that, one of the... I think salient points is that if it becomes publicly facing, there's two things. One, that policy compliance slide, you're then de facto communicating with the public, which then raises the bar on a whole number of policy issues. It becomes a very different environment if you're communicating externally versus communicating internally for everything ranging in our case from official languages to accessibility for those with disabilities to a whole number of different areas, right? So there's that issue. The other issue is, you know, we're really providing these wikis as a place for public servants to collaborate with each other in a free-flowing environment. And does it change or restrain or constrict their ability to engage with each other openly if the whole world sees it versus if it's only public servants, you know? And I would, I would postulate that that problem or that consideration exists, not just in government, but in the private sector as well, right? I mean, there needs to be some kind of space for people to have internal conversations you know, as well as external conversations. But your point's definitely very salient, and, and I do hope that you'll be keeping an eye on kind of um, whether or not these, these dynamics are kind of catching on, whether there actually is a wave, you know, kind of happening in government, uh, because I do think this would be the time. Uh, so just one moment first. Uh, Bob, uh, someone from the Internet? Yes, um, we have se actually several questions, I think, because we are uh, live streaming this and we have a group at the uh, embassy in Ottawa that's viewing this online. So I have a few questions on GCpedia. First, I think that Ryan might have addressed is that is it accessed by all parts of the Canadian federal government and are there other uh, Government of Canada wikis and provincial government wikis. That's one question. And then, since every GOC site has to be bilingual, what challenges did you face on that? And then also, uh, have you looked in, and this could be a question for all, have you looked into social behavior to increase engagement and contribution rates? Okay. I'll do a quick response to those three questions. Um, so on the first, it is, generally speaking, accessible to all public servants. And this is a, it's actually a technology issue, not necessarily a policy issue. It was launched on our internal government-wide secure network as kind of essentially the cloud that hosts it. So every department that uses that as their internet access point has access to GCpedia from behind the firewall. In practice, what that means is 95 plus percent of public servants have access to it. There's a handful of kind of smaller agencies or crown corporations that don't have access to it because their internet connection comes from a, a different pipe. But essentially, virtually everybody internally does. Um, there are a number of provincial governments and city governments I know of that have been creating wikis. Uh, just one example, the Ontario government actually had put up an external wiki publicly facing to do some social policy development last year and I think had a fairly successful experiment with that. Um, the Ontario government though as well also has internal wikis. I know a number of other provinces and municipalities have started moving in that direction. On the second question around bilingualism, uh, it's right, there is obviously uh, in Canada there's two official working languages of the public service, both English and French, and
and both of them have equal status. So how we've dealt with this and as well as some of the other policy issues is, as the creators and maintainers of the system, our obligation is to make sure that GCpedia itself is bilingual. So the interface is bilingual, you can toggle between French and English, all the functionality is available in both official languages, but then it's up to the user to make sure that their content is in the language that needs to be based on what it is. So people are just discussing or they're working or they're commenting on something, they're allowed to contribute in the language of their choice as they are if they were at a boardroom table or in their day-to-day -day work. The only times when you have to translate something on there is if you're putting something forward for official discussion or as a significant draft of a document. So that example I gave you of how we use GCpedia to help crowdsource the development of our Web 2.0 policy, every time a new draft would go up on GCpedia, we'd put a new draft up in English and French because it was a significant version of the document, but then people were free to comment in whichever language they chose to. But really what we've done with those policy issues around official languages is the burden is upon the user to make sure that they are using the language that they need to be depending on their use case. Um, and on the last point, just one example, we haven't gone I think as far as we would like to in terms of that gamification or social behavior. One thing we have done though is we've, we've created user badges so people essentially get ranks based on the number of edits they have, which I, I have to admit when I first started using GCpedia was a really kind of fun thing. I was waiting to go up from my novice status to my veteran status and I kind of, I would, I would edit sentences multiple times to kind of push my edit count up a little bit so I could cross the threshold. And so I think it works a little bit, but we, we've tried a little bit of that, but I think it's one of the things we've identified we want to do more of. Miss? Thank you. Thanks for this panel. <laughs> Excuse me. My name is Laura Lai Kelly. I'm at the New America Foundation. And I wanted to ask you some questions uh, that are de definitely relative to public um, interaction, but it's the first branch of government. And that's uh, how these platforms might help inform and increase evidence based decision making for the U.S. Congress. Um, Congress, as you know, uh, if you've worked for the federal government, has some really uh, obsolete last century statutory prohibitions from the federal government even communicating effectively on real-time information. There's laws from the 40s uh, that prohibit uh, that knowledge, especially from the civilian agencies, getting to Congress. Um, there's these legislative liaison offices that communicate, and I would, as a former Hill staffer, say um, counterproductive and often uh, prohibitive way of sharing real information because it's so controlling. There's committee hearings, um, which are usually theatrics uh, for home districts. Um, not a lot of real solid, uh, comprehensive information shared, and um, really dysfunctional communication from the repository of experts that exist in the federal government to the U.S. Congress. I and mean, I love what the Marines are doing. Thank you for that. But I would say that this problem shows up more in civil military issues in Congress because of our over-reliance on the military to do all kinds of issues um, and activities abroad that probably should be civilian. This is a problem from the last 20 years. Um, and I'm just wondering, is, are any of you thinking about building platforms on top of or working with organizations to build platforms on top of what you're providing. Uh, and this might answer that question as well. I mean, Congress is the outfacing, the public facing federal agency, and it is an orphan when it comes to solid information from real experts. So I've got a few things on, on that that might be relevant, and, and please pipe in too um, with stuff from your, your angles. Um, so one of the central tenets that uh, is is, was we made a lot of effort to make sure it was in the digital government strategy when it launched about six weeks ago. Uh, and um, it came up through a few examples, including some of the work we've been doing at the Federal Communications Commission before. And that is, uh, we call it a couple of things. There's the idea of .govs as APIs. And then a part of that, though, we all know about, hey, we should make um, web services available for this or that data section. But then there's a real important subsection of that that is content as APIs. So uh, when we rebuilt FCC.gov uh, in Drupal, we actually also built a module and open sourced it that was able to take any Drupal website and basically, in the matter of an afternoon, make all of the content uh, available via APIs. So you have to think about, you know, like websites, of course, are also made up of press releases and guides and reports and a lot of, a lot of verbiage. And so trying to start to make that available uh, dynamically to third parties by whatever standard you could come up with. 
Um, we put a lot of effort to make sure that was in this effort going on now, and we're working to scale that out. So there's 100 Drupal.govs. There's about 30 uh, WordPress.govs, and that's increasing very quickly. Um, we're trying to find similar solutions for uh, percussion and a few other. Uh, the aspect being that at the end of the day, we're going to have to be somewhat uh, platform agnostic, because I think many of us have the experience to know that soup to nut overhauls to, to really fundamentally fix the technological issues in government are, are too, they're very massive, arguably too massive. Um, and we know that everyone in the public's going to have use cases where they're going to expect to be able to just have an app for it or find it on Facebook. Basically, like people are going to find this without government. And so I think the, the model that's helpful to you is in, instead of, um, Instead of trying to completely overhaul these engines, what we're really trying to push is this mantra of uh, abstract yourself so that anything that's front facing currently, anything that should be public or is public, should be something that a third party app developer in Spokane can build a cool app for. Uh, and there's a lot of effort going into trying to uh, ingrain that thought at agencies and I think it's finally happening. Uh, and, and that seems to me like the path by which we have a chance of dealing with these things, as opposed to starting you know, at the core of IT and <coughs> redoing everything. So it's a bit abstract, but I think that's, I think that's actually gonna play a strong role. And the great thing is wikis, of course, are you know, made very well for, for abstraction like that. But, but it's also important to not be hung up on the tool as opposed to just getting it outside of ourselves. Do y'all have any? Uh, I know we have uh, more questions from the internet, but did you have any other uh, quick follow-up or anything? No, I was going to say, like, just the other thing is something like the Department of Homeland Security has to report to over 80 panels yeah. in Congress, I and mean, there's no consolidated method of sharing mm -hmm. internally. And I think if this it was incentivized, the cooperation from the outside, it would respond. I mean, Congress is just obsolete and, and incapacitated. It's not as corrupt as people think it is. It really does need help, and people would welcome it on the Hill, Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. Uh, Bob, I see you raising your hand. We have a question for uh, Liz. The, um, it's on the screen. Could Marsim's approach to field data collection and parsing be used in disasters? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's definitely something that we are investigating, um, getting into a bit, because these humanitarian assistance projects are very much applicable to complex emergencies. Um, you know, the kind of data that's being collected on the ground is very much uh, disaster crisis type information, just not necessarily in a disaster uh, context. Um, but actually, while I was in Thailand, there w was a little bit of uh, disaster relief data collection going on. Um, after the floods that happened last year, uh, some of the Marines went into flood relief sites to collect medical information on the civilians within those sites. And uh, based on that information, they delivered medical relief. So absolutely, definitely could be used in disasters. Um, that's definitely something that we would love to get into. And we had two follow-up questions on that, if you don't mind. Could MARSIM be shared with NGOs who are active within a specific region, and is MARSIM available for reuse by other USG uh, folks? It's a golden question. Um, MARSIMS right now is only for use by uh, US military. Um, so at this point, it is closed to the public, and, and that's necessary at this point because on a technological level we haven't um, enabled the type of user type of role-based um, access controls that are really necessary um, because we're collecting information on uh, foreign civilians and that is necessarily sensitive um, but that's that that being said that that's not the trajectory the trajectory that we want the project to take we definitely want to be able to interface with NGOs and share what information we can share with other agencies and, uh, and organizations. So once we have uh, the infrastructure in place to really um, uh, enable users to view information based on their 
roles or their functions within the data collection process or within uh, the realm, the, the, the humanitarian assistance realm, we're definitely um, hoping to, to move that way. Just to follow up that, um, has there been any talk within your unit of open sourcing uh, your implementation, uh, just the code? Uh, there has not been any talk okay. of that, no. Uh, sir, we'll get you next. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Leo Zimmerman. I'm a Wikipedia editor from Baltimore, Maryland. I just want to state that I think the real disaster we need to be concerned with is our continual, continued decision in the United States to pepper the globe with our military bases. I feel this is a violent relic of colonialism. For example, there is a marine base in Okinawa, Japan, with a persistent record of terrorizing the people who live in that region, widespread rape, environmental destruction, uh, death of endangered species, destruction of coral reefs. There was a report that people in the area found barrels of Agent Orange leaking out into the nearby water supply. I feel that no amount of technological gloss is going to correct this problem in a culture that values war over peace, fundamentally. Thank and you. I think we all have a personal ethical responsibility not to cooperate with this project. And I think people involved with the Wiki project should be appalled to see their work going to uh, an endeavor like this. Okay. Thank you. Miss? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Richters. I work at Finca International in Knowledge Management. My question for you is we're currently developing our knowledge management strategy and one of the things that we've been looking at is our document management system. And a lot of the topic that has come up along our discussion has been this culture of not wanting to use the document management system. People don't want to put their documents up there because it's an added step to the workload that they already have. So I was wondering what your recommendations would be based on your experiences with your platforms, how we can get rid of this negative culture associated with, well, I have to upload something. It's an extra step. You know, one, one thing I guess maybe I would add on that is uh, in the GCpedia um, experience, one of the things that it's used for quite a lot, uh, I certainly use it for this, is when we have interdepartmental working groups. Um, you know, and everybody, and I think this is probably a similar case in other governments, each individual department or agency is within its own IT silo in many cases. We're actually moving away from that in the government of Canada, but it takes time for big systems change. And what this allows you to do is, if, you, if I had an interdepartmental working group of people from 12 agencies, let's say, you know, in the past, if I wanted to circulate a meeting agenda or the record of decision um, to everybody, the only viable way to do it was email, right? And, and what the wiki allows people to do is post this up on a wiki page. The members can watch it. You know, you may still send an email out to folks to notify them that new documents have been posted up there, but it dramatically simplifies that back end amount of work in terms of the back and forth and discussion and viewing of it. And I think once people get over that initial cultural resistance to having to learn a new tool and they see the efficiency gains from being able to do it that way, people become converts. But there really is, there is that initial push. People have to be given the incentive to go on there and try it. And I think actually to Liz's point, you know, with the example of the Major General, yeah. after a couple of days you see how much more efficient it is and people want to start using them because they are more effective and efficient. A general suggestion on that is find a population for whom it's useful and encourage that it, them to use it and, and, and cultivate the aspect that is useful for them. That moves the ball, but it's slow. Hi, I, I just want I have a question, but to follow up to that young lady, uh, mm -hmm. I know I have to upload things in my job, and actually we I went into training with uh, our office, o OMS is the office management support staff, and so they are great partners in uploading your documents. So you, you might want to see if you can structurally organize mm -hmm. your office so that the support staff can can do the upload because they will upload what you give them. They won't edit it or anything. My question, uh, Marcy, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know your name is not Marcy, <laughs> but there's so much going on. I'm trying to tweet, I'm trying to, I mean, you know, I'm, ah, you know, with the <laughs> iPad, I'm here, I'm there. What is her name? I know there's a, a booklet and I apologize. As a 
gracious federal government employee as, as I am. Welcome and great presentation. But I, I have to tell you, I would have been one of your uh, doubters <laughs> in the field. You remember you started off by saying that the couple of your military users were going, uh-oh, what is this? Let me send this memo to the commander commander and see what happens there and let me send it through. You're right, this is a lifesaver. Everything, if you can tag it and you can search it, uh, it reminds me of Google. You know, if you go in with a good question, you'll have good outcome. But here's my question. Can you trust, can you trust that this is going to give back the data correctly that you want? And I'll give you a very simple um, say, um, example. I actually do use my calculator here on the iPad, but then I do it longhand just to see if it's right. How technology, technological aware am I? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I think to that point, um, you know, the ingestion of data is from the field into the wiki is uh, you know, 100% accurate. It directly ingests those those mobile apps, and we actually have it on another server as well. So we've we've gone through and checked, and and there's there's definitely no discrepancy there. Um, but something that I think you did um, hit on a little bit was um, the difference between the individuals collecting the mobile data and the individuals who are actually truly immersed in the wiki. So we have the uh, we have the troops in the fields, and then we have the troops that are doing planning when the, within the office, and they are really immersed in the wiki. But the individuals who are collecting a lot of the data that's driving all of this, um, all of this analysis don't necessarily get that same level of interaction with the wiki, so they don't have that same connection to know that the data that they are inputting into the system is being used in such a, such a great way for analysis. Um, so that's something that we definitely um, that we definitely, uh, moving forward, want to kind of help these field collectors recognize the power of the data they're collecting and, and, and its ultimate use. So I know we are running short on time, and there are lots more good events today, starting in about two minutes. So real quickly, let's get to you, sir, and then also uh, we'll try to answer pretty quickly as well. Okay, Mark Dronfield, Department of Education, Budget Line of Business. Uh, Ryan, you had on your slide, I really, appreciated or were um, identified with the one where it talked about the Gartner trough of disillusionment and that gap between the early adapters and that sort of thing. And Peter, you were starting to get into the thing where I was going, which was uh, what are the, th the things that are going to be able to keep you from crashing and burning? You know, a trough of disillusionment, you're hoping that plane is going to come out of the dive, right? And so are there best practices? When I post something on YouTube, how do I know if it's going to go viral? You know, uh, what, are the, what are the things that you all think are the best practice or, or the keys to being able to get something where it's going to get out of that point where it comes out of the early adopters but it becomes a general accepted and, and it becomes something that everybody's using? Are, are there things that will help us be able to get there? Because that's where I am with the project I'm working on. And a, a way I'd paraphrase that then as we go through this real fast is if you could go back 12, 24 months to yourselves working on these projects then, what's the one thing you want to convey? One is keep costs down so it's sustainable during a period where it isn't yet in uh, common practice use. Um, I would just say collecting requirements from the field and, and customizing so that the community of practice can gain as much use or as much value from it as they can. I was going to say two things on this. I think the first one is I think it's inevitable. I think in the same way when email was first introduced and it was only used by a few people, it was inevitable that's eventually going to be used widely. I think the same is true with Web 2.0 for internal collaboration. The only question in my mind is when, not if, and our actions can speed that up by a number of years, but it is eventually going to happen, if for no other reason, through sheer demographic change in the public service. Um, but you know, my one tangible answer I would give you is, I think right now we have a situation where a lot of kind of the working level uses this. Senior, senior leaders understand it and speak about it publicly, but we need that middle management layer to start using it. We need directors and director generals to say to their staff, I want you to give me this document on the wiki, not I won't accept an Excel spreadsheet, I won't accept an attachment in an email. And once directors, because we have to recognize government is hierarchical, start saying this is how you're going to start working, that will have a big, lasting, scalable change, I think. 
Okay, let's say thank you to Gray, Peter, Liz, and Ryan. Wonderful discussion. Uh, we're going to take a 20 minute break and then uh, we're going to be back for another panel just like this, talking about much of the same issues. And so please come on back because I think you'll enjoy it too. <laughs>